Now that we have finished learning the structures and the characteristics of the individual amino acids, as well as the process to combine amino acids forming a peptide bond, we need to move our attention more to proteins. In chapter four, we want to explore the structure, function, and folding of proteins. In chapter four, our specific learning goals include looking at the structure and properties of a peptide bond. We then want to move into the hierarchy of how proteins are structured by looking at the primary, secondary, tertiary, and sometimes quaternary structures. As we learn how proteins move into these different um, primary, secondary, tertiary structures, we want to use some characteristic fibrous proteins such as keratin, collagen, and elastin to look at how the structure can help lead to the function. And then we'll look briefly in this chapter at globular proteins but we'll really move more into these globular proteins and their structure function relationships as we move into chapter five. We'll finish the chapter by looking at how protein folding and denaturation studies can tell us more about proteins. There are six big themes that are covered in your textbook. And so I do think it is important for you to go back to these six themes as we go through and start learning things about the structure of proteins. Number one, three-dimensional structures of proteins are determined by the sequence. That is why we spent so much time looking at how different pHs can affect the charge of amino acids, for example. So it's actually the individual sequence, the order of the amino acids, that really drive how the overall protein is folded. Number two, the function of a protein is going to depend upon the protein structure. Number three, proteins exist naturally in a very small number of conformations. So you have to, from this point forward, stop thinking of proteins as a static molecule. Instead, you need to think about proteins as existing in a, a favorable conformation. So proteins can theoretically fold many different ways, but there's going to be some driving forces that lead to that protein wanting to stay in a more specific structure. Number four, the non-covalent interactions are actually more critical when we think about forces driving proteins into a folded state. Number five, there are some common patterns that we can observe. And number six, protein structures are not static. We can change the structure of a protein. So let's begin to think about the three-dimensional conformation that a protein prefers. The structure that allows the protein to be functional, that is called its native fold. So in the native fold, there's going to be a lot of forces that are causing the protein to fold into that native fold. But there is somewhat of a driving force that makes the protein want to be completely unfolded. And so if you'll kind of draw your attention to the bottom of the screen, there are some forces that make the protein want to be in the unfolded folded state here. What makes the protein want to be unfolded is truly just the entropy. So in the unfolded state, the protein can move around as much as it wants to, so there's a lot of disorder in the protein. In order to drive and move the protein into the folded state, there has to be enough forces to overcome that natural drive for entropy, that natural drive for disorder. And that's what we see with our proteins. These are the most important interactions that can overcome that entropy, allowing proteins to fold. And they're in order. 
the most important effect, favorable interaction that causes proteins to fold is the hydrophobic effect. So all of the nonpolar amino acids are going to try to get away from the aqueous environment and move to the interior of a protein. And that's going to be the first thing that drives a protein into the folded state. The second important force driving proteins into a folded state are hydrogen bonds. And now we've already seen that every amino acid has an amine group and a carboxylic acid group. And so just looking at these two groups, you can see we can form hydrogen bonds between these two groups. And that's actually going to be the really important driving force that allows our proteins to begin folding into the common secondary structures like an alpha helix or a beta sheet. Now after hydrophobic effect and hydrogen bonds, we do see the London dispersion, these weak interactions, these van der Waals interactions, so, and also some electrostatic interactions. For example, we will spend a good bit of time looking at salt bridges which can be formed when two cysteine residues are in close proximity, allowing the formation of a disulfide bond. This figure shows you the overall four different regions or different types of folds that we get within a protein. So the different levels of protein structure. First, we have our primary structure. The primary structure is simply the order of the amino acids starting from the amino terminus to the carboxy terminus. Locally, these amino acids will interact, forming a secondary structure. And a common secondary structure is an alpha helix. Multiple secondary structures will interact all throughout the protein, allowing the fold into a tertiary structure. So all proteins are going to have this primary, secondary, and tertiary structure. Some proteins will exist as multiple polypeptide chains interacting, forming a quaternary structure. So the overall driving force leading to formation of these secondary, tertiary, and ultimately quaternary structures is the actual sequence, the primary structure. When we look at secondary, tertiary, and quaternary structure, what we're really trying to do is get all of those hydrophobic interactions, moving all those hydrophobic residues to the inside of the protein, and then allowing to maximize all of our hydrogen bonding. So one of the first things we need to do is really take a good look at the structure of the peptide bond. So if you will recall, a peptide bond is formed between a carboxylic acid and an amine group through a simple dehydration reaction. Because of the characteristic of this peptide bond, we can actually see some resonance, which recall from your previous chemistry classes, resonance is sharing of electrons. Due to this electron sharing, we get a partial negative characteristic on our oxygen and a partial positive characteristic on our nitrogen. This causes this bond to be very rigid and very planar. Now it's good that we get this very rigid bond because it's less reactive, meaning that this bond will not break. We're always going to see this trans conformation around what has a almost double bond characteristic, no cis really involved, unless we have some odd structures going on. Now, since we have this very rigid peptide bond, and it's going to stay in this trans conformation, we will get very little to no rotation around the peptide bond. All of the rotation or movement that's allowed in our protein is going to occur between the alpha carbon and the carboxylic acid carbon, and the alpha carbon and the amine nitrogen. And so if we can take a look at this and think about this three-dimensionally, in this picture we're showing you the peptide bond here in what looks like a pane of glass. So there's no movement that can happen between this carbon and this nitrogen. 
but we can get rotation around this bond. We call the bond between the amine nitrogen and the alpha carbon the phi bond, and it can rotate up to 180 degrees. We call the bond between the alpha carbon and the carboxylic acid the psi angle, and again, this can rotate 180 degrees. So what we've done is we've taken these all of the different proteins and we've allowed them to consider the fact of what if we had complete free rotation around every single phi and psi angle in the protein. Because theoretically we do have this amount of rotation. But if we take this and we plot this on what we call a Ramachandran plot or diagram, we see that as we start rotating in certain ways, our R groups are going to get too close together. Or we may move things so far apart that we don't allow proper or favorable hydrogen bonding. So even though we can rotate around these phi and psi angles as much as we want to, it turns out we don't typically see this. Instead, the folding tends to clump in some very specific angles. And from studies, it has turned out that the angles we form in these more common favorable um, phi and psi angle distributions are actually what allows us to form an alpha helix and a beta sheet. So by rotating our phi and psi angles, we get an alpha helix and a beta sheet. An alpha helix is going to be stabilized by hydrogen bonds between very nearby residues. I'm going to show you that in a picture in just a moment. The beta sheet is going to be stabilized by hydrogen bonding between adjacent segments, but they may not be quite as nearby as our alpha helix. And so let's go ahead and look at first the alpha helix. When we consider an alpha helix, we will call an alpha helix either right-handed or left-handed. The alpha helix is going to be held together by hydrogen bonds between the backbone amide nitrogens and four amino acids later, the carboxylic acid of the amino acid. Okay, And so we're going to fold the backbone and the backbone is represented by this right here. Alpha carbon, carbon, nitrogen. Alpha carbon, carbon, nitrogen. So that backbone structure is going to rotate in a left or right-handed helix. And the R groups are going to stick out to the sides. So you can't put the R groups in the middle because that will interfere with the hydrogen bonding of your alpha helix. And so let's look at this in a little bit more detail for you than that ribbon structure. So looking here at this alpha helix, this is a right-handed alpha helix. Okay? And so if we follow the backbone, that's what I'm doing with my pointer, these big purple residues, or not residues, these big purple balls represent the R group sticking out to the side. And notice how we have a nitrogen, hydrogen bonding with carboxylic acid, nitrogen, amine group here, hydrogen bonding with carboxylic acid. Okay. So the um, hydrogen bonds are going parallel with the long axis of our helix. The R groups are sticking out perpendicular to the long axis. Okay. And so let's think about this question for a minute. What kind of sequence would give an alpha helix that had one hydrophobic face? So remember, every four amino acids, they're going to interact with each other in hydrogen bond. So if we wanted, for example, these, this side of the alpha helix to be hydrophobic, then amino acid 3, 2, 6, 9, 10, those would be hydrophobic residues. If we wanted this side to be positively charged to interact with something else, then this side would have residues like lysine, arginine, 
amino acids that would be positively charged at neutral pH. So let's think about some things that can affect whether or not this helix would be stable. So it turns out that we have discovered that alanine and leucine are going to be what we would consider strong helix formers. They're very small. They're hydrophobic. So they allow phi and psi angles to properly twist and rotate because there's not a big bulky R group in the way. So they help our proteins form a helix. But things like a proline, that is going to interfere with the ability to form a helix. So proline is considered a helix breaker. Glycine is also considered a helix breaker because it's got such a small R group, it can allow the fine triangles to rotate too much. And so if you take a look at this chart that I've included from your textbook, the higher the number, the more it's going to interfere with forming a helix. The smaller the number, the more likely you are to form a helix. So you can see proline has a big number. Some other large numbers that would interfere with the ability to form a helix would be things like phenylalanine, tyrosine, tryptophan. They're really big, so they get in the way. But also glycine, it's too small. So it allows too much rotation. So these are things that will affect your helix stability. When we look at the helix, the helix does have a dipole moment. And what this tells us is that all of our nitrogens tend to be facing in one direction, and all of our carboxylic acids tend to be facing in another direction. So we get an overall net effect of a more positive characteristic on one end, and a more negative characteristic on the other end. So now let's look at the structure of the beta sheet. The beta sheet is not as tightly woven as an alpha helix. We still see this backbone structure forming the interior, and then we'll have the side chains poking out. But with the beta sheet, they're poking out in opposite directions. And so if you notice, we'll have one R group down, then the next R group is up. One R group down, next R group up. And so let's look at these as they interact together. So we can form an anti-parallel beta sheet. So this would be my amino terminus, because here's my amine backbone groups. And so this R group's up. The next R group is down right here. You can't see it. It's below the screen. R group up. And then we keep going. Now we're opposite, going in a different direction, forming hydrogen bonds between two different beta sheets. Parallel, they're going the same direction, still hydrogen bonding between adjacent sheets. And so looking just at the hydrogen bonding with these adjacent, adjacent sheets, you should see why the anti-parallel is more stable than the parallel. Notice that the anti-parallel has hydrogen bonds in a much more linear format. In the parallel, the hydrogen bonds are a little crooked, so it's not quite as stable. In order to make the turn, to allow beta sheets to interact, we form beta turns. What's interesting is the amino acids that don't do well in forming an alpha helix, they're very commonly found in these beta turns. So if you can think about, we have amino acids that have these appropriate angles allowing us to form these really pretty alpha helices. Those opposite amino acids are going to allow us to bend way too much so we can bend completely around forming a turn. So if we go back and look at our amino acids here forming this beta sheet, they keep going. Then we would have a glycine, a proline, and it would allow us to complete a perfect right angle to form our next sheet of our beta sheet. 
There are two traditional types of beta turns. In the type 1 beta turn, we always have a proline in the number 2 position. In the type 2 beta turn, we always have a glycine in the number 3 position. As we start considering the tertiary structure of a protein, we're thinking about the overall spatial arrangement of all of the atoms within the protein. And so what that means is we're not just looking at the interactions in one small place like we were with an alpha helix. We're looking at all of the atoms together and how they interact. The protein's tertiary structure is going to be stabilized by a lot of weak interactions. So we're really looking at how the alpha helices and beta sheets are interacting together. And you can almost think of the disulfide bonds as really locking that overall protein structure together. But it's not a perfect lock. We can break those disulfide bonds when necessary. There are two major classes of tertiary structures allowing us to form fibrous, fibrous proteins and globular proteins. So let's look at a few of the characteristic fibrous proteins together. What is interesting about the fibrous protein is we can really look at how the structure of this protein gives us the function. One thing you will see and notice about all of these fibrous proteins is they are designed to be strong or strong and flexible. So let's first look at this alpha keratin. Alpha keratin is a common fibrous protein found only in mammals. It has evolved to be very strong. Alpha keratin is the most common protein that we see forming our nails, hair, horns, claws, things of that nature. So when we look at the structure, Keratin is this nice alpha helix, and then the alpha helices will interact together, forming these large fibrils. Okay. So if we look at how all of this is together, we can see that this one alpha helix interacts with another alpha helix, then this two chain interacts with other two chains, forming these protofibrils and ultimately forming the overall structure of alpha keratin. Okay, So when we look at alpha keratin, this is kind of small, but hopefully you can see, this is a right-handed helix. But these two right-handed helices will interact together, forming a left-handed fibril. Very, very strong, insoluble protein. Collagen is very similar. What's different about collagen is collagen is going to have long stretches of glycine and proline, so we don't see that characteristic right-handed helix. We'll see a left-handed helix, and the left-handed helices will form a triple chain folded together in a right-handed fashion. So if we notice this one helix here is left-handed, but three left-handeds fold together in a right-handed way. Elastin is a little bit different from our other two because elastin also needs to have the ability to stretch, not just be strong. So what gives elastin its ability to stretch? Elastin is going to have a hydrophilic region and then a hydrophobic region, then a hydrophilic, then a hydrophobic. And so it's going to tend to twist and fold together, allowing those hydrophobic residues to interact with each other. And so this is the relaxed structure. But then we can pull or stretch and pull those proteins out when we stretch it and pull it out, that exposes the hydrophobic regions. When you expose the hydrophobic region, once the pressure that has caused this elastic protein to stretch is released, then those hydrophobic residues want to hide again, and so it's going to move 
back into its relaxed form. So how are these globular proteins going to be different? They'll be water soluble and all of the hydrophobics are going to move to the inside allowing the hydrophilic residues to interact on the outside. And as I said, we'll really look more at these um, globular proteins as we move into the next chapter. The next little section is looking at a few of the common motifs or folds. And all a motif really is is a special arrangement of the secondary structure. And I don't want you to memorize these. I just want to show a few of them to you. So very commonly, we will see a beta alpha beta loop where we'll have a beta sheet and alpha helix allowing us to get to our next section of our beta sheet. Because remember, these two beta sheets are going to interact together. The alpha beta barrel is also very common. And now our last hierarchy we want to look at is the quaternary structure. We'll also look at this quaternary structure in a lot more detail in the next chapter, and we'll use hemoglobin to understand this quaternary structure. Now, studies of protein stability and folding are really accomplished by looking at some different things that can denature a protein. Okay. And so what we'll look at is, for example, as we increase temperature, once we get to a high enough temperature, that's going to cause a loss of integrity of the protein. Um, you get more movement, and then eventually you'll find your melting temperature where your protein will come unfolded. Okay. So heat or cold can affect hydrogen bonding. Let's think for a moment together how pH extremes can affect hydrogen bonding. Let's say we have a protein that's folded together at neutral pH of 7. If we raise the pH very high, up to pH of 11 or 12, that's going to cause the overall charge of our amino acids to change, correct? If we go very, very high, even our um, basic amino acids will lose their positive charge. So if that positive charge is important in stabilizing the protein structure, then changing the pH can cause the protein to unfold. Organic solvents will cause a protein to unfold because they cause the hydrophobic residues that have been hidden on the inside to flip and want to come outside. And we can also see this with other agents such as urea. There are also ribonuclease refolding experiments where we can take urea in the presence of this mercaptoethanol which is going to affect our disulfide bonds. We can cause the protein to completely unfold and then if allowed to sit and remove these denaturizing agents, then the protein will refold back itself. This is just a way to prove that it really is the sequence that's driving the folding of the protein. So just in closing, some general rules of protein folding. So as the protein begins to fold, your secondary structure will form first. Those secondary structures will begin to interact, forming your tertiary structures. Hydrophobic interactions stabilize. And then we can lastly form some motifs and domains. I close my discussion of this chapter with wanting you to understand that if we spend an entire chapter looking at how proteins fold, well then a protein that is folded incorrectly can probably come with some huge medical importance. And so one example I can show you is if we have a misfolded protein looking at this amyloid protein, they can actually begin to associate together when they're formed incorrectly, they're folded incorrectly, and we can get major clumps. This is one of the factors that we see with Alzheimer's. So your assignment for this week, you will see, is to find me an example of how a misfolded protein can lead to disease. So please make sure you take a look at that assignment.